All right. Hey, welcome, folks, to uh, yeah. On This Hello. Hill, a podcast from Church on the Hill. Yeah, you got high energy today? I've got really high energy Do today. Do you? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Good. I I'm feel excited like, to be on, actually. I'm it's, glad. I've, I've never feel done like a our podcast, podcast before. We need some energy. Yeah, yeah. So I'm glad that you got some. <laughs> yeah. What? Uh, the, apropos of nothing, not uh, what did you do this morning? This morning? What have you done um, this morning? To be honest with you, not a whole not lot. Not too much? Got, okay. Yeah. Last night, um, Melissa asked me, do you have anything to do in the morning? I said, mm-hmm. no. And so she clicked my alarm clock off. And so, oh, really? Which was actually a huge oh, wow. blessing. Yeah, Typically, cool. it's every single morning, 6 mm. o'clock, but yeah. woke up this morning at 7.30. Oh, that's nice. And I was shocked at the time, but it yeah. was, yeah, huge blessing. So, uh-huh. yeah, so I'm a little bit more rested up today, yeah. so which feels great. What time did the kids wake up? They woke up at 7.30. So we woke okay. up when they woke, woke up. up. Okay, yeah. that's really sweet. Mm-hmm. So this is uh, Taylor Wilkins. Uh, you have been, how long have you been ministering at Church in the Hill? How long have you been? Uh... Well, okay, so I was a volunteer for a few years, but yeah. on staff I've been on since July 2020. Okay. Yeah, I thought July 2020, COVID year, was a great <laughs> Perfect year time to, to start ministry. To move, to have a kid, <laughs> and to start a new job. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. your mom and dad have been around us for a while too. Yeah. Yeah. They, I think they're probably seven years. I've been here for about 11 years. Yeah. I love your mom and dad so much. Yeah. Yeah. They're They're great. They are the best Mm -hmm. and they're constantly encouraging me. Like every time they see me. Yeah. I saw, I ran into your mom uh, Mm -hmm. a couple days ago in a Starbucks Uh and she's like introducing me to somebody and just like Uh being so kind and generous and saying nice things about me. And I'm like, yeah, you believe those things. That's amazing. Uh Wow. Thank you. I have to, you know, I have to like, okay. Receive the compliment, uh-huh. just take it in. Yeah, welcome to my childhood. That was oh, really. <laughs> she made new friends everywhere we went, yeah. every vacation. Like we'd be day one at, yeah. you know, Disneyland or Sun River, and all of a sudden she's making a new friend. I could definitely but, believe that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, how? Tell me, tell me your your story. I happen to be wearing your alma mater. Yes, Corbin University. Yeah, uh, established yeah. 1935. Yeah, was it Western Baptist? I they start it was with Western Baptist. Western Baptist back then. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I mean, there you go. I, I went to school at Corbin University mm-hmm. um, because I had a track scholarship. So a yeah. lot of people go there because they want to become a pastor. They want to go into ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, Corbin was starting a track program. Okay. And they needed bodies to be on that team. And you were a body. <laughs> and I was a warm body that yeah. had a confession of Jesus, but I was not following Jesus. I wasn't walking with Jesus. All right. Um, what high school did you go to? Milwaukee High School. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And my whole life was sports. My whole identity was sports, mm-hmm. everything. If you talk to anybody from my high school, I mean, they might say Taylor was, I was kind of a flirt. Oh, And were when you? I say yeah. kind of, like I was a major flirt in okay. high school. It was unhealthy. It was not good. Yep. Um, <laughs> And then I was just all about sports. I lived in the weight room. Yeah, it was. Huh. That was Taylor pre. Yeah. Surrendered to Jesus. Yeah. What yeah. was your in, in track? Because track is a wide range of things to do. Yeah. What was your thing in track? I wish I could say I was like a phenomenal track athlete, but yeah. I was the most average track athlete. Mm. At every single event. I was right there with you. So the only yeah. thing I could actually compete in was the decathlon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that so you did everything, kind of. Y- yeah, I did nothing well and everything mm-hmm. okay. Um, but it was so much fun. I loved the decathlon, loved yeah. my time at Corbin. Well, something um, happened between being a flirt and being a, a uh-huh. pastor of, of, you know, youth. I really hope something happened. Yeah. Because... <laughs> 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 Taylor from <laughs> high school was not here. Here. <laughs> very Let there qualified be a redemption for this. story in this uh-huh. no, Yeah, kidding. yeah. Um, I was totally living for myself, living yeah. for you know whatever pleased this right here. That yeah. was that was my life. Um, d- manifested in different ways, just unhealthy addictions, unhealthy mm-hmm. practices, lifestyle. And I knew that it wasn't good. I yeah. grew up in the church. My my parents were always good about being involved with young life, with the mm. youth group at my church. And um, so we always kind of had this constant flow of being around the church, but I wasn't surrendering to it. I was still living for myself, living for the flesh. Mm-hmm. Um, when it came to me going to Corbin, I was actually creating so many issues at home, just being 
you know, whenever you just start to live for self, it's going to create issues with the people that are closest to you. So, yeah. so like, honestly, it was like constantly butting heads with my parents. Mm. Um, I just wanted to do what I wanted to do and I was still living under their roof. So yeah. one day I get this phone call from Dave Johnson, who was the athletic director at Corbin university. Mm -hmm. He basically said, Hey, a, a friend of yours told me you're a track athlete. Um, we're trying to start this program and they said, you're also a believer. And so I'm like, yeah, of course. Like I love Jesus. Um, I love Jesus. And I don't think I can get into a uh, D one school. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, and so I visited the campus. They offered me a, a scholarship. Um, and, uh, my parents basically were like, Taylor, you can either go to Corbin yeah. or you can look for another place to live. Oh, wow. It was, I was yeah. causing a lot of problems at home. Yeah, you were then, yeah. Um, and they were graceful. And it, it's not like it was just this, like, we don't love you. Like, sure. it was like, mm -hmm. in order for us to be healthy and I think for you to have space to figure things out, that was kind of the ultimatum. Yeah. So I went to Corbin and, man... That was a wake up call. Yeah. You know, being surrounded by people that mm. love Jesus and they've yeah. already kind of crossed that bridge, but then I'm right. on the outside and I'm still trying to live for, for me, that was, man, I felt like I was under a microscope. Mm. The music that I listened to, the way that I would talk, the jokes that I thought were funny, mm -hmm. everything was just messy. Yeah. Yeah. So you were feeling conviction. Oh yeah. Yeah. I didn't know if I'd call it conviction. I, I yeah. thought it was like these people are religious. Yeah. That's what my mind said, even mm -hmm. though it was really just me yeah. wanting to live how I lived. Um, so after the first semester at Corbin, I didn't want to go back. Mm -hmm. Um, I called my parents. I was like, I'm done with this. Like everyone's just, you know, so, uh, hypocritical, like they're religious yeah. and I, I don't want to be here. Mm -hmm. And so I told my parents I was done found out if I did that, then it was actually going to be more expensive for me because then I didn't fulfill the scholarship. And Oh, yeah. So... Yeah, so suddenly the bill is yours. Yeah. And so I, I decided, okay, I'll fulfill the scholarship from this year and then I'll be done with it. Um, and so I just, you know, I started really pressing in. I'm like, maybe I could get an opportunity somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I'm pressing into, you know, I, I'm training every day. I'm, I'm working hard, but... Uh, one day I was playing basketball with some friends, mm -hmm. went up for a shot, came down, and my ankle just popped. And it was actually a pretty unique ankle injury. Ligaments on both sides of my ankle tore, and so it just ballooned. It was, <sighs> it was a pretty nasty injury, yeah. which I'm thankful for now because it was through that. Um, I just hit this rock-bottom place. I'm around a bunch of people that I'm not connecting with. Um, so I just had this disconnect from people, which I've always been a people person. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't have sports anymore, which my whole identity was wrapped up into that. And I, I just started asking questions that I wasn't asking before. Yeah. Um, it started with me kind of throwing rocks at heaven saying, God, why did you bring me here? Mm -hmm. Like you brought me here to do track, but now I can't even do that. Yeah. And that was just me kind of being blind and frustrated. Um, and so I literally, I remember one day I'm sitting on the couch in my dorm room and I, I just picked open my, picked up my Bible. Mm -hmm. I flipped it open to Mark chapter four and I just start reading it and like actually like thinking about what it said. And it talks about the four seeds that are scattered, one in the rocky soil, one choked out by the weeds, one um, picked up by the crow and the other one was in good soil mm -hmm. and produced 40, 60, a hundred fold. And uh, I remember reading that my leg is up, I'm, you know, crutches, I'm all wrapped up and I'm hurting spiritually, mm -hmm. physically, you know, in every, every way, like I was just hurting and God convicted my heart and I saw myself as the rocky soil. Mm -hmm. I'd go to the youth groups, I'd go to things like I'd have moments where yeah. spring up quickly, yeah. but I had no roots and so I'd wither. The seed hadn't sunk in. Yeah. Yeah. There was no place yeah. for it to actually break up the ground. Mm -hmm. And so I, I went out that night, it's pouring down rain, probably one o'clock in the morning and just the most dramatic looking scene. <laughs> I was going like, to say, that does sound like very I, cinematic. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think like for me, like it had to be that way. <laughs> um, and so I, I went out. like Shawshank Redemption. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. In the rain. Like, legitimately, that's exactly what it was. Awesome. Yeah. And, uh, and I just <laughs> fell down to the ground out in like the back forest behind mm -hmm. Corbin. Yeah. There is forest back there. 
And I just, I got on my knees and I said, God, I'm tired of living for myself. Mm. I'm tired of being a seed that doesn't have any roots. Mm. And there's these like huge roots of this tree that I was next to. And I just put my hand on those roots that were popping up out of the ground. I said, God, I want to have roots that, that are big like these roots. Like I want to be like one of these trees that's, that's big and actually produces fruit. I love it. Yeah. So that was yeah. the change of trajectory was yeah. that day. I love it because one of my f- favorite scriptures from when I was kind of first really getting serious with God, and the seed wasn't just like bouncing off of my, mm-hmm. <laughs> of my heart, uh-huh. uh, God you know, brought me to uh, the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, mm-hmm. for they shall be filled. Yeah. And I, I've always remembered that, that if you ask for good things, like, God, I would like to have roots like this. I would like yeah, to be like... Yeah. Why wouldn't I give yeah, yeah. Taylor that thing that he wants? Like that's what that's I so want. Good, yeah. He's finally wanting the uh-huh. right thing. Yeah, yeah. And that when you want right things, when you want yeah. righteous things, then yeah. you get them. Yeah. Like, How much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't always get that because I, I think there was this. Well, maybe I just have to earn it, or I'm not good enough. Yeah. And when I just learned to start asking like a child and trusting, yeah. like a kid, my my kids when they were little. They didn't doubt my goodness, even mm-hmm. though I was very much just a human, you know, dad, lots of failings. Mm. But if they said, I'm hungry, mm-hmm. I fed them. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I'm just a normal dad. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. yeah, let's feed you. Yeah, here's a, here's a rock. Like, yeah, no, no way. No way. There's no way. I gave them good food. I, yeah. you know, I, I love to see them happy, enjoying stuff that I could provide for them. Yeah. And so God, of course, is going to be so much more faithful than that. And yeah. That's good stuff. So. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, that's so... When was... When did that shift happen for you? Like, I, I know yeah. we've talked about you were that kid that was always going to the altar. I was. After, you know, something yeah. had clicked it. Yeah, point, I definitely, but... as, as a little kid, as from a very young age, I was, um, man, I, I, I did love Jesus. I mm-hmm. really loved Jesus. But I fell into a real legalism. Hmm. I, like, in my teen years, yeah. I really fell into a hard legalism that just... Hmm. had hardened my heart in a mm-hmm. way that like I needed to fulfill righteousness yeah. to be seen as lovable. Mm-hmm. Um, and partly that came also from addictions. I'll just, you know, say it straight up. I, I fell into a porn addiction and it yeah. was a as just a very young man. Yeah. Back before the internet even yeah. existed. That was the same thing with me. Yeah. Back mm-hmm. back in the day when, you know, neighbors' dads had magazines and stuff mm-hmm. in places and and uh, and so there was this deep, deep shame, mm-hmm. and this religion, and this love of God that was all yeah. mixed together at the same time. Completely. Yeah. And uh, and so God really had to. You know, it's a it's a longish story. I won't be able to share it all here, but God really just got a hold of me one day, and I realized because um, at that time I was already like even on my way into ministry and doing things, but still all of that that I just described, mm. and God got a hold of me, and I realized like. I have, I have to, I have, like, this isn't real. This isn't a real relationship with God. Yeah. yeah. I mean, He loves me, and I talk to Him, but I'll never be free mm. if I don't confess mm-hmm. and if I don't live a transparent life. And, uh, wow. man, I fell into a puddle of tears, and I'm wow. like, God, I'm going to lose everything. This, this is going <laughs> to... You know, and this was, again, a while ago before mm-hmm. the Internet was really even a thing, and guys at my church weren't standing up and saying, I have a porn problem. Mm-hmm. Like, it just wasn't happening. And mm-hmm. so I'd never just seen him. it mm-hmm. play out in front of me. And I knew I had to talk to my wife, and I knew I had to talk to people that, you know, mattered. And mm-hmm. uh, and I got on the ground, you know, before I, my wife got home from work one day, and uh, mm-hmm. I was, I mean, I, I'll never forget just the, like, God, I feel like I'm about to lose everything, but I also feel like I can't live this way. I have to talk. I have to say something. Yeah. And I got, and as soon as I opened up, I got the grace of God. I got the grace from my wife. I got forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this is what a relationship with God should be. This is freedom. This is, and not like I've, I've, I've never, you know, found myself in bondage to the things over the years, you know, from then to then. But I, I've, you know, it's it's such an obvious one. Yeah. It's so quick now. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. That's not transparent. I wouldn't yeah. be happy if people knew this. I need to confess mm. this. I need, you know, it, it's so obvious now. It's 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 harder to, you know, the devil's not going to get me exactly like that again, I yeah. think. Uh, so mm. that was a huge change in my life. It's sure. funny how religion can revert to 
like because you it's like yeah. you still have the desire to be effective. Oh yeah. You can you can yeah. be religious and have the desire to be effective as a believer. Mm-hmm. But it's the starting line yeah. is almost like it's outside of me. Mm-hmm. Like I don't have to change, but everything else has to change. Yeah. I can I can keep my vices, I can keep my bondage, mm-hmm. but you have to change. Yeah. Like do what I say and not what I do. It's so dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, and that I think that for both of us and um, something I, I wanted to get around to today, that revival, that personal revival that mm. happened in my life made me hungry and thirsty for revival yeah. that I've never, I'm, I'm never done with that. I'm constantly, like I've been in, I've been in ministry since I was basically 20 and I'm 51 now. Yeah. And I'm still like, revival. The fire is burning. Fire. Yeah, like, yeah. come on, God. You <laughs> yeah. know, every, and a personal, in my, my, my personal walk with the Lord, I'm always asking for revelation. Mm. I'm like, yeah. my, I, I say this all the time, so people will be aware of this, but my, my most consistent prayer is, God, give me a revelation of your value. Because what I see in scriptures, when I see people like click, it's like, oh, so, uh, like, God had to remove a veil from their eyes. That's it wasn't so something that they did. Mm-hmm. And so I'm as- constantly asking God, like, I know there's still veil. I know there's veil left. Like, pull off the veil. Yeah. Like, let me see who you really are. Let me get a little bit more of you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I'm praying that, like, for our church, for our community. Like, That's... man, when God pulls the veil back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, worship, too. Maybe we can talk about worship as well. Like, when I was young and re- religious and, mm-hmm. and legalistic, worship was, like, to me... Yeah, look, can we get through this so we get to the good part? You know, mm-hmm. the teaching, the the intellectual, the head stuff. I was super interested in that because that made me proud and puffed up. Yeah, the more I knew, the more I mm-hmm. could comprehend. The more notes I could take, the smarter I felt. The it fed the flesh actually, mm. and so I, I was always like, yeah, worship, come on, let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah God is good. Yeah, come on. And now I'm like, uh, if we don't get to the preaching because worship just explodes, that's a better Sunday than anything else we could do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's so funny how you can, like on both sides of it, like there, it's almost like there's pitfalls. The enemy mm-hmm. wants to, to wrap people up yeah. in these pitfalls on either direction. Yeah. Because there's, you know, on the flip side of that, if if the only thing that you do is, you know, just have a worship meeting, you don't ever get to training, like mm-hmm. yeah, um, correcting, rebuking, like, yeah. like preaching the word, mm-hmm. then you, you've got this other pitfall of like, you just like, you're moving based on what you feel, yeah. but there's no actual root structure grounding yep. in truth. Yeah. It is funny how yeah, those pitfalls. Yeah. So you work with, with young people. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm high school ministries. Yeah. What does praying for revival, working towards revival in worship, in word, in discipleship, like what does that look like for you? Because yeah. I know you you feel the same way I hear yeah. you. Well, and there's all such the a time. similarity between our stories. Mm-hmm. Um, I had you know the same struggle, the same addiction. Mm-hmm. Um, I gave my life to Jesus when I was 19, but then I was so zealous to grow in my faith that I stumbled into religion as mm-hmm. well. And and part of it was because I didn't want to be fully seen and fully known for me. Yep. Well, what did I struggle with? Like yeah. nobody knew about this struggle behind closed door. Yeah. Um, I got pretty good at making things look like they were going well, mm-hmm. but internally it was a mess. Yeah. And like, God does touch us even in that brokenness. Absolutely. I mean, there there was real life and real yeah. prayer and mm-hmm. real even some ministry. Still growing. St- yeah. But with like growing with shackles. Yeah, like exactly. Either the devil knew, growing. like, well, I got a leash on you. Yep. yep. Whenever I need to, I could just jerk that yeah. thing. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. either either you're going to stop growing at some point or the shackles have to come off. Yep. And so I, I got married with those shackles on, mm-hmm. never confessed, and then had that same yeah. moment right. one night. I was like, I mean, I'm, I'm dreaming of Jesus coming back mm-hmm. and I haven't confessed my stuff. So I'm, I'm having those types of dreams at night. Yeah. I'm freaked out and can't handle it anymore. Yeah. One day uh, during the Deep Purple series, probably, probably eight, nine years ago, mm-hmm. you and Bruce were preaching and uh, I'm sitting there with my shackles, the hidden struggles, addictions, past sins that I never confessed. And my wife is sitting right next to me and Bruce is 
closing out in prayer and he just paused and he does that thing where he leans in yeah. <laughs> and he goes, you know, the Lord is telling me right now, there's somebody in here yeah. that has been hiding stuff from your spouse. You want to be free, but you just can't confess to your spouse. Mm -hmm. And he said, the Lord's telling me you need to set a date this week and confess everything to your spouse. Leave no stone unturned. Yeah. And so he says that my heart's beating out of my chest. If my wife looks over at me in that moment, she's going to see my heart beat. Uh -huh. And so it was, to be honest, it was two weeks after no, <laughs> that I wow. finally confessed. Wow. I was, cause I was just, as you were telling that story, I thought, man, I think I'd want to put that as close as possible because whatever time it is between then and yeah. when it feels like the most miserable the time in your life. Cause you know, you have to do it. Yeah. You know you're gonna do it, uh -huh. so you just yeah <laughs> rip it off for uh -huh. two weeks. Huh? Yeah, it was it was painful, uh. but then the same thing though. Like when I confessed, mm -hmm. I felt the weight, yeah. and then I, I felt yeah. what true freedom actually does to your soul. Like mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh! And that scripture, Second Corinthians five seventeen, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Yep, the old has passed away, and the new is here. Mm -hmm. And so identifying myself as a brand new creation, I'm not even the same person that yeah. committed the sins that yeah. the enemy was blackmailing me for. Yeah. Like, so that, I guess that's kind of a long winded way of answering your question, yeah. but, um, somebody, I can't remember where I heard this from. I know Micah says this a lot, but if you want to see revival come to your community, draw a circle around yourself and start praying, God, revive everything in this circle. Yeah. And so with the kids mm -hmm. and how we, we pursue like transformation of life, it, it starts with the individual. Right. Like my individual connection, my individual freedom that I discover in Christ, um, my individual worship time, prayer mm -hmm. time, you know, generosity, yeah. all of those things because of my sincere love for Jesus is really that's that's the main thing that if, if the kids catch that, yeah, they're self propelled. Oh right. That's a great way of saying it. Man, like you don't have to continue to like yeah. try to convince them. Yeah, they're you're like, no longer pushing and prodding. Yeah, they're so convinced that they can't contain it anymore. Yeah. That's beautiful. I love that. I was just thinking while you're saying because I, I, I agree, I'm constantly, you know, praying as we pray as pastors and stuff, like God start here. Like start here in this Yeah, room. yeah. You know. I mean, I'm happy wherever revival starts, but I know he tends to move and start through through leaders, mm -hmm. servants. So I'm, I'm always, you know, ask, okay, God, start with me. But it's also scary. Yeah. <laughs> I can't think of the guy's name now. Oh, man. Sorry. Uh, but in the um, revival that was taking, the, taking place, Azusa Street revival. Um, William Seymour. Was African yeah. American gentleman? Yeah, uh-huh. I, I remember reading when I was young-ish, or younger-ish. Hey, hey, what's young in the kingdom? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to live forever. Yeah. That's right. I yeah. could, I'm just like an adolescent. <laughs> yeah. Eternally, I'm like an just adolescent. Just a gray adolescent. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I remember like just reading about him and, and what that looked like, and one of the things that said that uh, he used to preach from a pulpit that was like apple crates or something. Wow. And that he would um, sometimes not even really be able to preach, but he would stick his head in one of those apple wooden apple crates, hmm. and then ask God to reveal His glory. Because and I, I and the, you know the yeah. explanation was he wanted it and he was scared to death of it at the same time. Like mm -hmm. God, show yourself, mm -hmm. and then yeah. hide. Yeah, hide, hide <laughs> the rock. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and. I, I think that's a good thing. I don't think that's a bad thing because he is our loving father. He is our. I've I've heard you know people say if if you, I mean imagine yourself in the throne room of God, mm. uh, your first response should be to run and jump into his lap because he he's your father. And I, mm. I I I agree that is one very appropriate response. But also I see godly men in the Bible whose first response like is a, to fall flat on their face like a dead man. <laughs> exactly like a dead man. Yeah. Uh, or even in the presence of Jesus when he was still like in flesh and blood and they weren't even sure they were like ah, who is this guy this rabbi but then he would do something and Peter would get on his knees in the boat and go get away from me. Yeah. You know, I shouldn't be around you. You yeah, shouldn't be around I'm me. I'm a sinful man. I'm a yeah. sinful man, which is a crazy thing to say to someone in a boat. Yeah. A small boat like uh -huh. You know, get away from me. Like, where you want, yeah. where you want me to go? Yeah, <laughs> just walk out there. Yeah, but I, 
I guess I'm, I'm saying like that, mm-hmm. that feeling is a feeling I, I have a lot. Like I want more of God. And then I'm like, can oh. I handle any more of God? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I have to, if I like, I'd be crazy not to be, you know, be willing to handle more of God. Yeah. And so I want that. I want that in our church. I want that, you know, the, that breaking loose to happen. Well, and, and there's that connection of like, because everything that has to do with, with revelation, everything that ha- it's like, mm-hmm. For me personally, to see Jesus, that's where the journey begins. Faith is being sure yeah. of what you hope for, certain of what you do not see. Mm-hmm. So when you're, the eyes of your heart are opened, that's like that's like the first step of transformation. Is it's like we talk about like knowing your why. Yes. So you have to wrestle with that to mm-hmm. know your why. You have to really meditate on that and think through that deeply. Mm-hmm to establish it and even to like make it established in your heart. Yeah. And so in order to be a follower of Jesus, I have to know who I'm following, which yeah. takes time to really look deeply into who he is. Mm-hmm. And I, I always think of the apostle John, yeah, like the disciple whom Jesus loved. Yeah. The, the guy was just yeah. like obsessed with the love of Jesus that, yeah. and how loved he was I, by Jesus. I often wonder like, did he make people <clears throat> uncomfortable? Completely, you know. I'm uncomfortable when I read. You I know, know you're like the disciple. Really, like, get off like, of him, man. Give yeah. him, a, <laughs> yeah. give him some airspace. Uh-huh. You know, I, I would imagine if He's I was leaning around on Jesus' yeah, chest. Exactly. Yeah. I imagine if I was around him because I tend to not be lovey touchy. Yeah. You know, I I love Jesus, but I'm you know physical isn't really my main love language. My yeah. wife is very physical, mm-hmm. very loving. You know, she mm-hmm. loves that touch, and so I get a ton of it from her, and I yeah. give a ton of it to her, mm-hmm. and so I don't need it from a bunch of other people. Yeah. But you know, whatever. But what, so I wonder sometimes when I read scripture with John, I'm like, would I be the guy going like? Oh. <laughs> Give me a break. Get off of him. We're trying to get some teaching done here. We're trying to, you know, yeah. do something. And yeah. he's just like, oh. Dude, we're trying to have dinner. Like, John, <laughs> <laughs> he's just about to break the bread, and now you're just snuggled into his chest. <laughs> I'm afraid I would be judgmental. And I'd be so wrong, because yeah. I love that about him. I aspire to Amen. that, but I also see that it's not necessarily my natural yeah. inclination. Yeah. Well, and like John talks about, I mean, John is the one that the book of Revelation. Mm-hmm. So, like the greatest revelation of Jesus Christ, yep. it opened up to John, the one whom Jesus loved. Yeah, and I think there's a key in there. I think there's a secret to to revival, mm-hmm. like for us as believers. That John even writes First John three verse two. He says that yeah. when we see him, we will be like him because yeah. we'll see him as he is. Mm-hmm. Matthew five in the Beatitudes: the yeah. pure of heart will see God. And so there's this purity yeah. that can only, it has to go through the purifying fire of yeah. the love of God. Maybe Joshua is another example that might be easier oh, for some yes. men to relate to yeah. because he was a warrior, he was a man's man, like no one, you know, he's never described as, man, that loving, lovable, squishy Joshua. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but he loved the presence of God when mm-hmm. Moses went into the tent of meeting he just stuck around. He just wouldn't leave. He'd be like, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. And and I and I love that because that that was me as a young kid. I was the kid who like, okay, he's still on the altar. Like, how much does he have to repent mm-hmm. of? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is a lot. <laughs> yeah. But also like they're just being in the presence of God. Just amazed by what he was the presence that he was in. You're just yeah. amazed by it. Couldn't walk away from it. Yeah. Well, and then he got to go into the promised land. Right. Like where Moses yeah. came up short, Joshua and Caleb too. Yeah, I love Caleb. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's, it's, I think yeah. it says Caleb had a different spirit. Yeah, they were old guys with young spirits. Yeah, you know when everyone else, you know, didn't and gave up, they're mm-hmm. like, "Well, not us. We're, yeah. We'll we'll go to the promised land. We'll uh-huh. fight the battle. We'll yeah, yeah." And even after they've already like Caleb in his in his old age, mm-hmm. like in I think in his eighties is like, okay, where do you want your territory to be? And and the mountain that was still in enemy territory, mm-hmm. like fighting up a mountain to take yeah. the ground. And he's like, that's the one that I want. Mm-hmm. Nobody was there counseling him, but like, are you sure? Like, yeah. you're getting pretty old. Yeah. Like, and giants. Uh-huh. They weren't just fighting younger men. Yeah. They were fighting giants. Uh-huh. I'm not afraid of that. Yeah. That's in the Bible. Yeah. There's giants uh-huh. in there. There's giants in the promised land. Yeah. And, and I think they were actual giants, not yeah. just intimidating folks. 
That's so good. And that they went after him. Yeah. They're like, I'm going to chase down that giant. This is yeah. a promise of God. Yeah. A giant's not going to win. Wow. That giant is on God's land. Mm-hmm. He's not even on my land. He's on God's land, and it's got to go. Oh, my gosh. And I, I think when I think of our city, when I think of our, our community, mm. there are some giants that we, we've got to say, we've got to draw a line and go, you're in the wrong place, giant. Yeah. I, I love the, you know, the David, you know, David's fighting the last of the giants. Hmm. Uh, you know, so it, the, it's it's now, you know, we have a kingdom, we are in our promised land, but mm-hmm. the last of the giants are still, a few of them are still around. And and as a kid, there's that moment when Goliath tries, he has intimidated an entire nation of mm-hmm. warriors. Yeah, the people of God. Yeah, and David's like, who is this uncircumcised yeah. Philistine? Yeah. Like, who is, who is this guy talking like this? Talking trash about yeah. about God? Yeah. About God's people? Like, let me go. I'll do it. If you guys won't do it, I'll do it. And I think there was a bit of the the young, you know, maybe arrogant young man in him. Mm-hmm. But there was also a love of God and a, and a desire to go, uh-uh, that's not going to stand. It's we so won't stand good. for that here. Yeah, the perspective. Like, I always think, mm-hmm. like, like, when the way that my life looks, like, the way that I'm, I'm walking out my faith right now, mm-hmm. like how much of that, it's, it's either what I'm seeing or yeah. it's what I'm failing to see. Yeah. And with like, I think of Caleb, like that's such a perspective of a revivalist mm-hmm. or, or David, like going yeah. before Goliath. Um, is it John Wimber that says like faith is spelled R-I-S-K? Oh, I don't know. That's I, a great I think one. I haven't John actually Wimber heard it. That, okay. That, that st- st- started saying that. Yeah. But, faith is spelled risk. That's yeah, beautiful. Yeah. And so... Hmm. To see that mountain that mm-hmm. it's like, wow, that's an unbreakable enemy territory. Yeah. Like the school district. There's yeah. no way. Nobody can just go in there and mm-hmm. see revival break yeah. into the government. Place. We're too far gone. Yeah, the government. It like, is what it I is. I mean, Oregon's lost. Like there's yeah. there's no hope. Baloney. But to have a different perspective, because yeah. there were 10 spies, yeah. right, that went into yeah. to spy out the land. Yeah, 12... Twelve spies went 12 to spy spies. on Canaan. Yeah, Ten yeah. were bad, and two were good. That's yeah. the kids' song. Yeah, yeah. So the two, <laughs> the two had a different perspective. Right. There's a different spirit in them, mm-hmm. and so I'm same like, facts, same information in yeah. front of them. Yeah, but ten saw it one way, and two saw it yeah. a different way. And and the difference is the spirit. That's yeah. In them. yeah, yeah. They're all the people of God. They've all probably had some level of experience with God. Yeah. But when it came to the moment of facing the enemy. Mm-hmm. Is where they're like, no, they're too big. Yeah. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. Yeah, the government's just too gone, too far gone. Um, yeah, but then those yeah. people that are like, no, like, like, no, we can do this. Like, we can take this. Like, mm-hmm. I know that God can change the heart. I know that mm-hmm. God can put the right people in a position to actually bring real change. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I have a love hate relationship with the. Um, like I, I don't deny reality. Yeah. I, 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 some of the people think faith is denying reality. Barna comes out with new statistics, and they mm-hmm. say the church is in decline. And they, and I don't deny that all of those facts are true. And I like to read about them because I mm-hmm. think it's really great to be informed. Yeah. But they're not my spirit. Yeah. Yeah. That's not the spirit that's in me. The spirit that is in me isn't the church is in decline. Yeah. You know, we probably better circle the wagons. And take the the you know the Benedict option and just be a little bit more insular and just wait you know out this dark ages. Mm-hmm. But the church will survive. But yeah, it's going to yeah. be a, a lesser yeah, yeah. drawn you know withdrawn community. And mm-hmm. I say uh uh-uh. uh yeah no yeah that's not the way I see it. That's yeah. not the way I I see God breaking out over and over in in history. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think of Jesus like when Lazarus had died and he's explaining that to, to the disciples. Yeah. Like as, as, cause that, I think that's a good picture of when there's a real thing that has happened, Lazarus has died, mm-hmm. but Jesus told the disciples like Lazarus is sleeping. I need to go wake him. Yeah. And they're like, if he's sleeping, then he'll wake up. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Then Jesus just says it plainly like, no, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> Jesus wasn't lying because <laughs> no. he can't lie. Yeah. And so he's not lying when he's saying Lazarus is sleeping, but he saw something oh, different yeah. that no one else was seeing. Yep. Oh. Okay. I could go on and on about this, on this mm-hmm. in particular, what you just described, and I'm, I'm starting notes on it because I don't know where, what to do with it. I don't know where it fits or where it's going. 
but I think there's so much truth to that. There's the, um, my daughter and I talk about this faith because she is a, uh, she is a romanticist. Mm -hmm. She studies, you know, literature. She's an English major. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, she just came back from England where she got to like walk in the footsteps of Jane Austen and learn in the same university as C.S. Lewis (laughs) and, and so, you know, she loves that stuff. And I love to read. I love that stuff. She's more educated than I am. She's smarter than I am. So, But I, I'm trying to hold my own in conversations with her these days. <laughs> but uh, we were talking about how um, with the Enlightenment, you know, there's this, you know, science jumped onto the stage and, and suddenly became what, what, you know, the priest used to come out in the robe and be the authority. And then cut to today, the new authority is the man in the lab coat. He steps out like a prophet, but he's a prophet of doom mm-hmm. who says, this is what is real, this is what is... And and there's no hope, there's no future in it, there's no love in it. It is just biology and numbers. Yeah. And the Enlightenment, you know, it, it's a myth that people, that everyone used to think the old earth was flat. By the Middle Ages, everyone pretty well knew that the earth was round. There might have been a few people who didn't, but pretty much mm-hmm. everyone knew. But they, they, they took, you know... Uh, a world that maybe some people thought was flat, and they they rounded it, and they made science big and important, but they lost the meaning. They don't. There's no more mm. meaning in anything. Mm. And I think you know what you're describing, what what is, and what I see in scripture is people get hung up on. Well, are there really giants, though? <laughs> I mean, that yeah. was then, and this is ancient literature, mm-hmm. and you know Noah. Yeah, you know, and 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 a, a worldwide flood. I mean, it's probably mm-hmm. a local flood, mm-hmm. and you know, Jonah. I mean, that's got to be a story that means something, but it doesn't mean he was swallowed by a fish. Or, and I'm like, what are you doing? Stop trying to strip the meaning off. It, like, it, it's describing the world around us better than anything else. Much better than any scientist can describe the world. The Word of God describes the world around us. It gives meaning to our world. And when I see revival wow. break out, I see meaning come to someone's life. Wow. Like there is now my life has a meaning. My life has a purpose. My life has a direction wow. because I'm in a family. I'm in a kingdom. And mm. Well, and how much of that too, like we see Jesus as like that dividing line because even yeah. like because even people that believed that way in Jesus time, mm-hmm. like it, it's what what you see is what you get. Like yes. this it's the physical world like that is reality is, yeah. is the physical world and Jesus is the dividing line mm-hmm. that there was never enough evidence for someone to believe in Jesus even when if they would see it with their eyes right. yeah. and i think that's still at, people still chose not to believe yeah. so it wasn't overwhelming in a sense that well we have to believe in Jesus now because some mm-hmm. people chose to believe and some people chose not to yeah and and how miracles too like the miracles that Jesus did even miracles that are still happening today mm-hmm there's this fight and there's this warfare that there has to be a scientific explanation. Right. Yeah. And it, that's really like, there's just such a dividing line there that what if it's actually true that when God spoke, creation came into being? Yeah. What if that actually is yeah. the story? That's where the story begins. Mm-hmm. And that's the, you know, that's the separating mark between, you know, just the scientific world and faith. Yeah. I think of it as sometimes colored by numbers, like the world without... Jesus and and his explanation, his creation of the spirit world, mm. just the just the physical world yeah. is like a paint by number sheet without any paint on it yet. It's mm-hmm. just lines and numbers. Yeah, and some people just see the world as lines and numbers. Mm-hmm. But the believer, God has come in and colored in yeah. everything, and mm-hmm. it, it and now you don't even see the number anymore. Quit thinking about the number. Mm. Like, well, uh, how did his cancer get cured? Was it you know, uh, yeah. I'm just going to paint over that number. You're uh-huh. not even going to see it anymore. It's cured. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's healed. Uh huh. You know, and is is there a scientific way that God did it? Maybe, maybe the, I don't know how He does things. When does He go in mm-hmm. and fix cells? And I don't know how He does it. Yeah. Uh, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I care that He's the God who intervenes. He's the God Absolutely. who steps in. Yeah, because it's not like becoming anti-science. I think that's one of those places yeah. where you know sometimes people feel like they need to pick. Yeah. Well, can I believe in science or or is it just faith? Yeah. And I'm like, how about like keep your eyes focused on Jesus, mm-hmm. redemption, 
um, like th- that scripture I shared earlier, Second Corinthians five seventeen, after it talks about us being new creation, yeah. it says that we are now Christ's ambassadors, and yeah. our job is to reconcile all things back to Him. It's like, well, how do I do that? Do I do that like through like science? Do I do that mm-hmm. through like taking care of God's creation around? Like, yes, yeah, sure, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Pick something, yeah, do it all to the glory of God. Mm-hmm. Is if I just pick up my trash and plant trees, hmm. is that the full glory of God <laughs> coming to the earth? It's not. It's not enough. No. It's no. not enough. It's something. It's very important. Something. Yeah. It's His creation. He loves His creation. Absolutely. It's very valuable. Yeah. But they're also like He is making all things new. Yeah. So there has to be a He in this. Yeah. It's not just me. Yeah trying to make all things new, being a doctor, mm-hmm. using chemotherapy and radiation. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Man, yeah. that is a call of God on your life to uh-huh. heal. Yeah. But there also has to be a he making all things new. Absolutely. And that's where you know the believer, mm. both those things touch and become real. Wow. I think we're spending a lot of time here. I think we're going to have to stop. Oh, it's so good. We yeah. should just keep going. What do you guys think? <laughs> Drop a like, comment. <laughs> you sure you haven't done this before? Drop a like and comment? I don't know. I'm like a fish in something. <laughs> like a fish in something. <laughs> this is where we're, this, we're, we're talking about. This is where we've been in First, Second Timothy and in, in un, unwaver, unwavering, like seeing Paul. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're a Paul. To these Timothys, these I hmm. mean, it's embarrassing for anyone to be called a Paul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you 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 know, you are working with young people, you're loving them, you're introducing them to the to the word of God, to the fullness of the spirit of God, um, to who God is recreating them to be. Mm-hmm. And that's what you know Paul has been doing here. Do you got as we close, do you got a scripture from Timothy you wanna wanna read to us? Before people mash that like and subscribe button, yeah, and write a comment. <laughs> oh my goodness! Your generation, it's like second nature. Yeah, share this with a friend. <clears throat> yeah, so Second Timothy four one through five, and then I think you have, I don't know, I do. You got Go one after me, yeah. okay? In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing in His kingdom. I love that he throws that in there. And in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them in great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Mm -hmm. But you, and this is where I think it's just like for all of us, like keeping it so personal, like Mm -hmm. draw that circle around yourself. Jesus, revive everything in this circle. I want my life to reveal who you are. Um, Keep your head in all situations. Endure Mm -hmm. hardship. I think of Jesus, like as he's being beaten, like he didn't open his mouth. Mm -hmm. The most pure and perfect, like endure hardship, like do it the same way Jesus did, even if it's wrong. Like, even if it's like, Mm -hmm. uh, do the work of of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Yeah. And so for every single one of us, like even like the great commission, Mm -hmm. um, you know, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore, uh, and make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the father, the son, and the Holy spirit and teaching them to obey Mm -hmm. everything that I've commanded you. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, and then Mm. the end will come. Mm. You asked about the why earlier. We'll just close here. But, um, like, man, a huge why for me is why. Why do you do it? Why do you Why get up in the morning? Why, you know, why is I want to see the glory of God. I want mm. to see it. And what I see in Scripture, like there's this manifest glory of God that breaks out, and then there's one day going to be a hmm. all-time great oh, come on. glory of God. And yeah. that, that seems to be <laughs> when this gospel of the kingdom has been preached to the whole world. Yeah. And then and then that glory of God is going mm. to show. And, uh, man, I think this, uh, I'm going to be bold and say, I think, this gen 
Z generation that right now is God is revealing himself to them. He's redeeming them. He's, mm-hmm. he's collecting them into a community. Um, I think they very well could be the generation that really spreads mm. that word out that goes just yeah. unreservedly. Yeah. You know, and, and I mean, you know, partially right here, I'll, obviously it's, this is a global call, but maybe right even here in America where young people are like, well, I don't know, the American dream doesn't sound big enough to me. Yeah. I want the kingdom of God dream. I want more. Wow. Yeah. And wow. I, I just want to, yeah. Mm. It's not thinking less, it's thinking <clears throat> greater. Yeah. Yeah. So God, as, as we close here, I just want to ask for it. God, would you um, raise up a generation of young people who are so on fire for you that they are like um, like brands that have just been plucked out of uh, a big bonfire and then just thrown <laughs> into the world and just light blazes everywhere, God, that the glory of God, that the fire of God, that the Holy Ghost, that the Holy Spirit, that the fullness of the Spirit would spread throughout throughout Salem, Turner, Kaiser, Oregon. God, those who, who say not in Oregon, we say no, in Jesus' name, Oregon, mm-hmm. on fire for you. Mm-hmm. God, that the, the U.S., on fire for you, God, that the globe would, the globe would sing your glory, mm-hmm. in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, folks, we love you. Yeah. You're the best. Thanks for hanging out with us. What should they do? Draw a circle around yourself. There you go. <laughs> love your family members, love the people around you, but mm-hmm. but make sure that you have that intimate, intimate connection with Jesus. Just yep. go lay on his chest like John. Yep. I think that's the best yep. application, like yeah. be alone with Jesus. <laughs> love Jesus until it makes the people around you uncomfortable. <laughs> Ooh, that's <laughs> yeah. good. Yeah. All right. Love you guys. Hope to see you on Sunday. You. It's where the see real you. stuff happens. Bye. <laughs>